Hello. I'm Steve Hansen. I'm the Vice Provost for International Affairs and Director of the Reeves Center for International Studies here at William & Mary. And uh, it's really exciting to have a wonderful event to kick off spring semester. This is our first Reeves Center event of the new semester. And uh, it promises to be one of the more stimulating conversations about a vital set of geopolitical uh, issues for the country uh, that we're going to have. Uh, so we're grateful to all the participants for taking the time to come down and share their wisdom with us. Uh, this panel on the uh, effects of Brexit is sponsored by the George Taylor Ross Addresses on International Peace, which is an endowment at the Reeves Center, uh, which is established to promote peace by exploring and investigating topics of current interest that affect relations among nations, ranging from international political matters to environmental questions. Obviously, this uh, topic is smack in the middle of that uh, mandate. And I want to just quickly tell you the participants, not in a particular order. Uh, I can't read all their bios because it would take the time we've reserved for the discussion. But uh, you should know that Susan Cork, uh, class of 96, is Senior Fellow and Director of bi the Bipartisan Transatlantic Democracy Working Group, that's TDWG, with the German Marshall Fund of the United States, which is based in the Washington, D.C. office, or she is. Prior to joining GMF, she was Director of Countering Antisemitism and Extremism at Human Rights First, where she worked to ensure that the United States led internationally on combating antisemitism and extremism in partnership with European allies, and an illustrious career including uh, stints in senior positions at U.S. Department of State, U.S. Embassy Moscow, uh, five years at Freedom House, uh, the list goes on. Damir Marusic is the non-resident senior fellow with the Atlantic Council's Future Europe Initiative. He specifically works on the Council's Balkans Forward, I guess I have to say hashtag <laughs> Balkans Forward <laughs> Initiative, a unique coordinated effort to foster a democratic, secure, and prosperous Western Balkans firmly integrated into the transatlantic community. And he's also the executive editor of The American Interest, a multi-platform foreign and domestic policy magazine that seeks to explain America to the world and the world to Americans. He, too, has had a long and distinguished career in international affairs. I have all our panelists, uh, was previously a fellow with the World Affairs uh, Journal's Transatlantic Fellowship Program, uh, MA in International Relations from Johns Hopkins, and BA from a, another good university, Johns Hopkins University. Scott Cullinan is an expert in U.S.-European relations with extensive experience working in the business sector, Congress, and advocacy organizations. Uh, he has served uh, over the last decade in various positions with the U.S. Congress, including as a professional staff member for the House Foreign Affairs Europe Subcommittee, where he covered European Union affairs, Russia, Ukraine, Turkey, Central Asia, and worked on democratic transition, rule of law, national security. Uh, he, too, is based currently in Washington, D.C., Many of you here are familiar with our own Clay Clemens, and we have to say class of 80. Sorry, it's in the uh, thing. I, a lot, lot of alums here. 1980. <laughs> <laughs> Who got his doctorate at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy and uh, has taught at William & Mary since 1985. He teaches comparative politics with an emphasis on Europe, and his particular research specialization is German party politics. His list of publications is uh, long and illustrious, and his articles have appeared in all the top journals, West European Politics, International Affairs, Armed Forces and Society, German Politics and Society. Uh, again, we're so pleased uh, to have Clay join us. And finally, last but certainly not least, is Rich Kramer, class of 94. So we have three William & Mary alumni on this panel who is the president of the U.S.-Europe Alliance, uh, who has previously managed the National Endowment for Democracy's program portfolio on Afghanistan, Iran, and Turkey. Prior to working at the NED, he managed programs in those states at the Le and the Levant at the Center for International Private Enterprise, CIPE. Uh, he also has taught law and research at the Jagiellonian University in Krakow, Poland, and was a Eurasia Program Fellow at the Foreign Policy Research Institute and affiliated expert of the Public International Law and Policy Group, advising the governments of Georgia and Montenegro. Uh, he is also a member of the Reeves International Advisory Board, uh, and so uh, Rich and I worked very closely together for, we were just saying nearly a decade, which kind of freaked us out when we realized <laughs> how quickly these numbers we put past our names start to get uh, ancient. Uh, sorry to say, okay. it's for me too, though. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, you get a sense for the quite remarkable panel uh, we have here today. So please join me in a warm William and Mary welcome for the entire panel. I'm not going to hand it over to Scott. Oh, here he is. He's going to say a few words. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to American-British-EU realignment, post-Brexit possibilities. Uh, as you just heard, my name is Scott Cullinane, and I am the executive director of U.S.-Europe uh, Alliance. Um, thank you all for, for being here uh, this afternoon. 
Before we start with Brexit, uh, let me tell you a little bit about why, why I am here and a little bit about USEA. Uh, US Europe uh, Alliance is a bipartisan initiative that was launched last year to mobilize Americans to advocate for the enduring transatlantic partnership. We at USEA believe that the 21st century will present a range of challenges for the United States. From an increasingly aggressive China seeking to spread its authoritarian model to environmental problems of a global scale. For all of these challenges, the European nations are Americans, America's friend of first resort. The US and Europe are the world's most integrated economies. Uh, European trade and investment means millions of jobs here in the US. We are bound together by our collective security interests, and we have a shared respect for the rule of law. Together, the transatlantic partnership is the greatest force ever to defend fundamental human rights worldwide. However, as the saying goes, past success is no guarantee of future performance. We cannot take this for granted. The success of the transatlantic relationship is not a fluke or an accident. It happened because leaders on both sides of the Atlantic made the right choices. And today, our generation is faced with similar choices. Will we work to continue the transatlantic relationship in this century or let it drift into irrelevance? After today's conversation, I hope you will agree that the US-Europe relationship is important to you. And if so, I would ask you to go to our website, useurope.org, and sign up for our email list or follow us on Twitter to learn about the ways that you can get involved in this effort. Now to Brexit. I don't know about you, but Brexit has me confused and a little exhausted. It has been nearly five years since then Prime Minister David Cameron announced his intention to hold an in or out referendum. And since then, it has been a whirlwind of votes, negotiations, missed deadlines, extensions, and it is not even over yet. In three days, at midnight on the 31st, the withdrawal agreement goes into effect, uh, and the UK will become the first country to leave the EU, ending its 47-year-long membership. From that point, London will have to, London and Brussels will have to agree on, on the future of their relationship during the, during the transition period. Uh, that realignment of the relationship holds significant implications for the UK, for the European project, and for the US. Now to moderate this conversation, I'd like to introduce the president of USEA and an alumni, as you, as you just heard, uh, Mr. Richard Kramer. Thank you, Scott. <laughs> this is work good. Hey, this is great, everyone can hear me. Um, I have to say on a personal level first, if you'll permit me, I'm extremely excited to be here today because as indicated, I am not only an alum from the class of 94, but I am an English literature major with a specific focus on Arthurian literature. And look, I'm back in Tucker today talking about something that has very little to do with King Arthur, but still <laughs> involves Britain. So funny how life kind of works out like that. Um, I don't want to take up too much time with just a couple opening remarks today, but I, I do want to kind of take a moment to sort of put this in perspective, um, or in sort of a greater context, if you will. And I was talking to Professor Clemens earlier, who I'm sure he has this down much more pat than I do, because apparently he can explain the EU in six minutes, which is like, that's remarkable. It's all the time uh, I left for it in my class today. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> so, um, but, uh, but nonetheless, it's pretty impressive. I'm just going to talk a little bit about sort of where we got or how we got to 2016. And I'm gonna go back to 1957, which sounds like a real long way back, but I'm not gonna like dwell on everything that happened exactly like year per year till we got to 2016. But it is worth noting that that was the year that the, the ball did, got rolling, did get rolling, excuse me, with the, the Treaty of Rome. And you know, there, were, uh, there were various economic communities at the time, but it all kind of came together in the European economic community. You know, there was one part on coal and steel, there was another part on atomic energy, what have you. They merged together in 1965, and you had this block. So why was this so important? I mean, from, from my estimate, and please forgive me, but for what it's worth, 
it was huge because we'd finally gotten to a point, granted there was a Soviet threat, but there was an also an understanding that the future of Western Europe, one that was not going to be decided by who was able to extract the most blood on the battlefield, was, was going to be involved through economic ties, that a way about bringing peace and ensuring peace was through economic cooperation. Eventually, other countries wanted to get, get in on this, Norway, Denmark, and including the United Kingdom. And it was all the way back in 1961 that the United Kingdom first applied to actually be part of the European Economic Community. And they were waylaid for a while because it happened to be that Charles de Gaulle was running France at the time and he was actually worried that, that the United Kingdom would be a Trojan horse for the United States. French and American relations have you know, had their ups and downs just like American relations with a lot of our allies. But nonetheless, 1971 rolls around, the United Kingdom it sub submits an application again, or they kind of get the process rolling, and by 1973, they become a member. Well, it was important, this is all important because in 1975, it was actually put to a referendum to the British people. Like, do you want to be a part of this community or not? And the vote was overwhelmingly yes, that sounds fantastic. It was like 67% and change that were in favor of this. So we want to fast forward a little bit from 1975 to 1993. There's the Maastricht Treaty, and there was a decision to go forward and create something much more akin to what we know now as the European Union, of course, and along with the, the strive towards forming a, a European Union, there was the, the economic community now became the European community, and different language, but it, the point is, is that the, a shared economy, or a common economy, was one of the three pillars of the European Union, to give you an idea about how important this was in, in the greater scheme of things. And this is also what opened up the door to the free movement of capital, of labor, and goods between all EU member states. This was such a great idea that no one really felt in the United Kingdom, at least the government at the time, which was labor, felt that they actually needed to go through a referendum process like they had back in 1973. This opened up the door for a very long period of resentment from a number of Britons that felt that they never really had an opportunity to participate as, a, as an electorate as to whether or not the Euro United Kingdom was going to be in the European Union. Then as time began to go by a little bit longer, the European Union had a lot of confidence. There were a lot of things that were going the right way back in the early 2000s, and there was an effort to actually have a constitution. There was a, the idea of a European constitution that would be a sort of a, a supreme governing document in many respects that would affect, in, in a lot of cases, the, the sovereignty of nations that were parts of the Union. Well, by 2005, it ended up going to French and Dutch voters, and they rejected it after 18 other states had said, no, we're okay with this. The point I'm trying to raise is that questions of sovereignty and questions of, of what being a member of the Union, European Union should be, is it something greater than the economy? Does it, does it involve a common foreign policy? Do we have common security concerns? To what extent does, does European Union law, if you will, is going to affect citizens in a given state? have been playing around for a long time. And for a lot of reasons that I'm gonna to turn to, and, and I, I think Dahmer's remarks are first gonna illuminate on, we'll, we'll address sort of where the currents are now. And hopefully, because we're talking not just about the United Kingdom today, but we're talking about Europe writ large. And maybe help shed some light a little bit on sort of what's been happening continent-wide that has led us a bit to where we are today in respect to the United Kingdom's coming exit from the European Union. And with that, Dominic. Mm -hmm. Thanks. <coughs> Thanks, Rich. Um, pleasure to be here, guys. <coughs> um, I just want to, uh, in my remarks, just very briefly, um, just focus the question right, because I think that the, the way the coverage is, uh, Scott was alluding to this as well. It's been so confusing, and all we're thinking about is, you know, Brexit. Even in the word, you have Brexit. What does this mean for Britain? Is Britain going to be worse off? What's this all about? Um, the reason I think that's misleading, and I think the focus really, I want to sort of try and just invert that a little bit, and think about Brexit is Britain, a country, leaving a much newer project, the European Union. And <clears throat> the argument, again, just tr trying to sort of sketch out for you here is that, uh, while we like to look at things like the rise of populism and nationalism, uh, you know, uh, Viktor Orban in Hungary, uh, the uh, Law and Justice Party in Poland, um, Brexit, and even to a certain extent Trump as these sort of causes that are disturbing the order, uh, there's another way to look at it, the flip side of it, which is that there's sometimes, you, you can see them as symptomatic. And if you just sort of take a step, step back and look at recent history, I mean, uh, what Rich was talking about, um, 
the EU as an institution has taken a lot of hits to its legitimacy. Um, I think, you know, one might mark it as the global financial crisis in 2008 was one of the, the big hits. Um, the Ukraine crisis in 2014 was troubling, but, you know, okay, the Obama administration also attempts to sort of get the, uh, the Europeans to do it on their own. Still, there was a sense of sort of crisis there as well, the Greek, the Greek debt crisis and the, uh, um, the, the highlights of that in 2015, uh, the migrant crisis that then hit in 2015, which then arguably, even though Viktor Orban was, was well elected at that point, really gave him a second wind. Um, uh, law and justice in Poland gets elected in 2015, and then you have Brexit in 2016, Trump as well after that. Um, so these are a lot of sort of uh, hits to the credibility of the European Union. And the reason that's important, I'm, I'm reviewing a book right now uh, by a professor, I think he's at uh, one of the UCAL schools, John Connolly, <clears throat> came out last week, it's called From People Into Nations, and it's really good. Uh, it's, a, it's a book about nationalism, and I think it's, it's, it's worth looking up. It's a bit of a doorstop, um, some 900 pages, but it's, it's, it reads really well. Anyway, if you don't wanna, if you don't wanna read it, the, it's about Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, the, the thesis is that nationalism, especially in that part of the world, uh, it doesn't, nationalism is a very tricky subject and it's different in Western Europe and East, but Central and Eastern Europe in particular, um, he describes it as a defensive crouch, that these are nations that are coming out of empires and uh, the, the real flowering of nationalism, even if it's the 19th century, it's something that uh, is, um, uh, it is constructed by intellectuals and it becomes sort of a project of emancipation, turns ugly, um, but it's, it's always defensive. It's a sense of uh, feeling of fear that, that, that uh, uh, of lack of protection or, or that these nations are going to get extinguished. Um, Stalinism repressed that and created a sort of a structure. And so, you know, for that part of the world, certainly uh, the 20th century, that ebbed. However, I'm from uh, former Yugoslavia and uh, the story there is somewhat different. Um, but then the interesting thing is what happens in 1989 is that you have uh, communism just disappearing. And uh, after 1989, you have this, what, what Rich was talking about, this rise of the European Union, this, this set of institutions, uh, Europe as an idea that's rising at that point. It has a lot of legitimacy. And you see that, especially in Poland, in Hungary, uh, in Czechoslovakia, which breaks apart shortly thereafter. But nevertheless, it's a real pull. There's a real legitimacy there. Um, and uh, you can see it at least up to 2008. I mean, Rich is right to note that, that uh, those referenda didn't go through. But you, you have you know, uh, Romania, Bulgaria, Turkey. It's still something that's keeping these countries on the straight and narrow. Um, but the Brits were never really on board with this sort of transnational idea that the European Union sort of started bringing up. And um, the fact is, you know, most of us sort of observing things, we didn't see it coming. I, I know when the Brexit referendum happened, I woke up in the morning, uh, I, I couldn't believe what had happened. And I, I think it's because, um, I don't think any of us really recognized at the time that that happened, that there was like the stabilizing, reassuring hold of the European Union was weakening. Um, and that all these things were sort of symptomatic of that. Orban in Hungary and Kaczynski in Poland definitely recognized it, um, and they anchored their political appeals after uh, you know 2008, and you know as as these other crises that I described in the sort of a fear that this legitimate institution wasn't living up to its um, uh, to its promise to sort of protect. Um, now you can call nationalism a an irrational appeal or it's not grounded in fact. There aren't any uh, migrants in, in Hungary. I mean, you know, they're all going for Germany and, and what's, the, what's the big deal? Um, but, but again, the argument is, if you keep in mind this, this idea of what nationalism is, is that it's a defensive crouch in a lot of places. And one way to look at what's happening is that, again, the European Union, the promise of it has gotten weaker. Um, so just one other remark to sort of flip it around to, to drive the point home. It's, Everyone is paying attention to Brexit. It's the big story. Uh, the other story you may have missed, uh, in October of last year, uh, French President Emmanuel Macron, a, a Europhile, um, he blocked the accession negotiations uh, for Albania and North Macedonia. Now, this is not accepting these countries. This is the begin of, beginning of talks to expand the European Union. Um, and, you know, we can argue about that, and it's not really the, the subject of this uh, talk, but it's, I think it's illustrative of 
the flip side of Brexit in a lot of ways. Uh, Brexit was disillusionment and uh, uh, you know, a certain percentage of the British populace voting to get out of this project that they were not uh, into anymore. Macron, a Europhile, who always talks about uh, an Europe qui protège, a Europe which protects, that's his whole thing, he realizes, in fact, that the institution is getting weaker. And his arguments for not expanding Europe have been that um, we have lost one of the biggest uh, creditor nations to the European Union. We're going to let in a bunch of poor countries right now, poor countries that I come from, but poor countries into the Union, has that going to be, is that a smart thing to do? It's ungovernable right now as it is. We lose one. We're going to let seven more in. How does, it, how does this make it better? How does it make the European Union better? He recognizes that it's weak. So, <clears throat> so I guess what I'd like to suggest to you, and my, my two colleagues will, will talk about this more in a more pragmatic uh, way, and we can then open it up as a discussion, um, but it's that the EU as an institution is weakening. It's not going to go away. Uh, it's too big. It's too powerful. It's too important. It's been around long enough. It's too institutionalized for it to go away. But it's a lot weaker. Um, and it's in trouble in its current configuration. So from the US perspective, Brexit was a tragedy because the UK was always a, uh, uh, a good means for us to organize our transatlantic relationships, especially with the Europeans. Um, now that they're out of this tent that's smaller and, uh, and, and, and tottering, um, uh, that's not really great for the U.S., but we have to be thinking strategically about how we organize things uh, going forward as the U.S. Uh, with the European Union, which is going to be around, but also in uh, uh, looking at what other institutions are there that we can uh, perhaps leverage. No, Clay, you want to go next? Yep. Thank you. Now that you all know what year I graduated from college, uh, it's, it's easy to sort of infer what years I was in graduate school. And I remember in 1982, sitting around with uh, one of my faculty and a, a group of students, and we were looking at the headline of The Economist, which was a tombstone, European Union, 1957-1982, rest in peace. <laughs> this was a time period of incredible stagnation in the European Union. And the first patch of territory, if not the first country, had just left Greenland, uh, which had departed the European Union. Uh, it didn't generate a great deal of wailing and gnashing of teeth at the time. But there was concern simultaneously, of course, because this was the era of Margaret Thatcher, the first rumblings in Great Britain, uh, that the sort of long-term ambivalence that the British always had about their membership in the EU uh, was really going to cause strains. Little did anybody know at that time that almost 40 years later, this would still be an issue in and for the EU and in and for British politics, which maybe at least in one respect, mercifully, is uh, going to come to, to an end in that, in that uh, at least in that form. Uh, there's always been that ambivalence in the UK uh, about membership uh, in the European Union, about identifying with Europe, period. Uh, the old headline from the, the London Times, you know, fog in the channel, continent cut off. Uh, sort of underscores that from the British perspective, the, uh, Europe is, is still another, another place. And even though early sort of post-war advocacy of the European Union was very strong in Great Britain, it was always a sense that it's for them more than for us. But when the pragmatic incentives of being involved in what was obviously going to be an ever bigger market uh, became greater in the 1950s and the 1960s, it did increase the incentive and the interest uh, in, in joining. But it was always a very devi divisive issue running right through the Labor Party, running right through the Conservative Party. And particularly in this period starting in the 1980s, you had all these pressures for opting out of parts of the European Union, for rebates from the European Union for, for uh, membership donations and so forth, which feed then into some of the things that the others have talked about, culminating in the pressure for, uh, particularly on David Cameron, to, to hold the Brexit referendum, which he probably meant mainly as a means of salvaging the unity of his own political party and ended up, uh, as so often is the case, triggering a series of, uh, for him, unpredicted uh, and unpredictable events that have, have finally led us to where we are. Uh, but I'd sort of like to look a little bit forward in where this sort of goes now, because as has already been mentioned, this is not quite the end of the story. Uh, when Britain leaves the EU in the next couple days, it's immediately going to be prompted into a series of negotiations with the EU about its future relationship in trade and, and other areas. And I, I'm going to just touch on that very generally and bring in what I'm most comfortable with, which is a little bit of the domestic political uh, dimension to all of this. The British incentive in the next couple of months, uh, if it indeed is successful in negotiating it in the next couple of months, uh, 
is to, main max, uh, is to get maximum access or re retain maximum access to the one thing that has always been most valuable for it about EU membership, which is access to the market, but to minimize the degree to which it has to subject itself to European rules, to minimize the degree to which it converges with the rules of the European Union. A hard, a hard uh, set of things to balance, but one thing, obviously, that the current British government has going for it that a lot of its partners across the channel won't is an incredible monopoly on political power that Boris Johnson won in the December uh, 2019 elections. I mean, this has uh, been a period of flux in British politics for the last five or six years. We've had minority governments. We've had coalition governments. This is the first really extensive majority since Tony Blair or Margaret Thatcher, and it's all Boris Johnson's. Uh, he owns the political party, he owns the House of Commons, and when you do that in Great Britain, you own the body politic. And so whatever he decides in the framework of the negotiations is going to be what Britain pursues. For the Europeans entering into this process, uh, obviously there's different layers of intensity about it and different layers of, of insignificance depending on how, in particular, how deeply they're tied into the trading relationship. and. Uh, in the case of a couple countries, other aspects as well. And you know, countries that are at the sort of uh, leading edge of this in terms of the significance of these negotiations for them include, of course, Germany. I think people are familiar with Germany and its automobile exports and the extent to which uh, its economy is, uh, if not dependent on trade with Britain, at least affected by it, but also the Netherlands uh, for a variety of reasons, both historic and economic, Belgium. Uh, has an incredibly deep uh, trade relationship. They want to maintain that to the extent possible, um, more so perhaps with a greater degree of, of uh, fervor than other countries like France that have perhaps a little bit uh, less at stake, somewhat less at stake. But obviously, they're going to have to maintain as much unity as they can on this as possible, and they probably will because the sanctity of this market that they have formed is really at this point the most important prize uh, for the European Union, but it'll be difficult. Domestically, they don't have the political foundation that Boris Johnson has going into this. We're entering into a, a period of uncertainty in German politics, both in terms of who will be in the government and who will lead it. The 16-year uh, reign of uh, Angela Merkel is, is coming to a close eventually. Uh, it's been in the process of, of winding down now, but uh, you know, who will succeed her and in what form of government? Um, the French government, of course, is beset by domestic problems triggered by Emmanuel Macron's uh, domestic reforms. The Netherlands faces an election in the next year or two. And so all of these things you know, will make it much more difficult for them to enter. They still, again, have this incentive uh, to hold fast to the European Union, but it's, it's, it's going to be difficult. One other player that's obviously of incredible significance in all this is Ireland. Uh, anybody who's followed the Brexit negotiations for the last two years knows that that's been a big issue the relationship in Northern Ireland and the Republic. Ireland has an election in the next couple of, of weeks. Uh, there's almost no likelihood of one party getting a majority. It might well have to form a coalition government with Sinn Féin, which is the Irish Nationalist Party, and its one precondition for that is a vote between the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland on unification of the island. Uh, that could throw an incredible monkey wrench into what's already going to be a very difficult issue of how exactly we make this odd situation of having Northern Ireland sort of partway in the European Union and partway out the European Union stick in terms of future uh, trade uh, relationships. Over the medium and, and longer term in terms of the impact of Brexit on the EU, it really affects what has for since British membership been this kind of triangle within the EU, of Britain, France, uh, and Germany. Yes, they're all relieved in a certain sense to see it ending because it's been such a distraction from everything else that the EU has to deal with. So many other crises, so many other challenges. And it doesn't just go back to the referendum. I mean, ever since Thatcher, there's been this kind of long friction, um, and even prior to Thatcher, uh, w with the British. And in a way, it liberates the French and the Germans who have always been, in that respect, greater advocates of, of the European project and more genuinely enthusiastic about it than the British. To, to play that role, but that axis or that alliance is not as cohesive as it once was in the past. Um, domestic politics comes into play here, but also somewhat conflicting visions of the European Union. Emmanuel Macron goes in for big picture uh, reforms. The, the appetite for that in the European Union really seems to be fairly thin, and it's certainly very thin in Germany. Um, and in fact, uh, 
For a long time, the second leg of the triangle has been something the German government has always fallen back on, having Britain there as a kind of convenient obstacle to French ambitions that get a little bit uh, too out of reach and, and not necessarily totally compatible with the German economic interests. Uh, Britain has always been a kind of useful barrier to the grand designs for uh, a, a much more integrated market that would come at the expense of sovereignty over the German economy. Germany and Britain, despite differences in other respects, have always been big fans of a much more liberal, open, competitive market and a much more liberal and open free trading order with the rest of the world. Germany loses that now. The Netherlands loses that. Ireland loses that. They lose, in a sense, a country that was both an, a partner and a kind of excuse uh, for not pushing these things further. And it's going to be uh, an interesting time to see how that leg of things works. And then there was a third leg of the triangle, which is oftentimes underrated, was the French-British one, mm -hmm. in the sense that they are the two major partners in the European project for the last few decades that have had a, a foreign and defense policy presence outside of, of Europe, and of obviously have you know, the residual nuclear power and so forth. And while that's not specifically a, a European Union thing, it does diminish in some ways the uh, foreign policy and defense presence of the EU to have Britain now on the outside uh, rather than on the inside. So in all three of these ways, it's not a tombstone for the European Union, but it's certainly a set of, a set of challenges. And I will say I have to flee back to my most comfortable ground, which is German domestic politics. It comes at the time when, you know, again, this in, uh, there are officials of the European Union. Most Europeans don't really identify who it is at any given time, whether it's Ursula von der Leyen, who's president of the commission, or uh, someone like that. But implicitly, it's almost always the chancellor of Germany. And the incredible, staggering continuity of German political leadership is really going to change now, because whoever replaces Angela Merkel this year or next is only the third German leader in 40 years. Uh, and whether it's Helmut Kohl before her, or to some extent Gerhard Schroeder, and certainly her, they have always been the kind of anchor of stability in European Union decision making. They, at certain points, have attended more European conferences than all of their partners combined. That changes, and uh, again, in a certain sense, the, the captain, uh, or at least the pilot, is, is leaving the ship, and where exactly that sets it, uh, I'm not quite sure. Well, it's really great to be here, um, doing a road trip down to William and Mary. Um, as Steve mentioned in his opening comments, I was uh, class of 97. I got my start in foreign policy here. Um, I wrote my thesis on how 24-7 access to information would change the conduct of foreign policy, and it certainly has. <laughs> <laughs> um, Margaret Thatcher, the first, uh, the college's first female chancellor, was the speaker at my graduation. Um, uh, she may have been called the Iron Lady, but in person she was incredibly funny. Um, I remember that when she would about to say something kind of cheeky, she would take her glasses off set them down, and then deliver kind of a very uh, witty line. Um, I remember she talked a lot about the special relationship between the US and the UK and how William and Mary represents that. Um, she also gave a few bits of advice that look really prescient now. Um, she emphasized that the rule of law is what make freedom work. Um, and she gave an early warning that we, could, we should be very careful about what the internet could mean for our generation, and that we should be careful about the content we put out there. Um, she could not even have dreamed about uh, how the internet could put the future of the US, UK, and other democracies at risk. Um, for a bit of personal bio, I've spent the past 15 years working to defend and advance democracy in Europe in and out of government. Um, one of my aims has been to hold the US accountable to its own foreign policy ideals, and on that I'd say we aren't doing that well right now. Um, in 2018, worried that um, in DC, it was becoming very partisan. Um, I founded the Bipartisan Transatlantic Democracy Working Group um, to bring people together across the aisle to refocus on the fact that the relationship with Europe really mattered for the United States, um, that we needed to fight to uh, defend against the democratic erosion that was happening in Europe and here in the United States. Um, so today I'm, I'm happy to be talking to you on the need to really strengthen the Transatlantic Alliance um, and focus on important questions on how Brexit will impact transatlantic relations for the UK, the US, and Europe. Um, Brexit, as everyone has touched on, has been internally chaotic for the country. 
Um, but it's also, we, it's also been a really messy problem for Europe um, and for the transatlantic alliance, not the least of which is that it weakens Europe at a time that Europe really needs to be strong. Um, one silver lining, I guess, is that talk of other Grexits and Hexits and Pegsits um, have been silenced. Um, but Europe will definitely be weaker, poorer, and will remain preoccup preoccupied with the Brexit fallout um, rather than addressing more pressing problems, perhaps. Um, aside from France, the UK is the only serious military player in Europe. Um, so that Brexit will not only mean that the EU is uh, losing a large contributor to its budget, um, but it will also have implications for European defense and security. As Clay said, though, this doesn't have to be its tombstone, um, it, it needs to be managed right, and it needs to be an inflection point where we decide to double down. Um, as Britain heads away from the EU, its role in NATO becomes ever more essential um, as a way to demonstrate its continuing commitment to both collective security and regional cooperation in Europe. Um, and NATO perhaps can provide a more natural format for relations. And now that Brid Britain's bridging function between the US and Europe will take place primarily within rather than outside of the alliance. Um, attention to NATO and interest in success, its success will be essential. Um, I think uh, the head of the NGO Chatham House had a good way of saying it. He said, the UK must balance its transatlantic heart with its European head. Um, I wanted to take just a minute before I talk about Brexit specifically to take stock of the transatlantic alliance and Europe's authoritarian resurgence, um, which included some of the drivers that led to Brexit. Um, I think Damir talked about, you know, the in 2008, uh, we began to see a shift in Russia and Europe, um, the financial crisis, uh, the period of relative <laughs> peace, prosperity, and stability between the end of World War II and 2008 um, was upended by the economic crisis. Um, and then the refugee crisis in 2015, um, we saw a lot of uh, ethno-nationalist, ethno-populist forces um, gaining popularity. And in that, Russia really saw opportunities to stoke divisions in Europe to weaken the alliance. Um, Brexit, of course, was driven by its own internal dynamics, but Russia really stood to benefit from that. Um, the Russian goal to weaken the EU took several forms. Recruitment of European leaders and parties, who would help further the Russian goal of European disintegration, stoking divisions and separation initiatives like Brexit, uh, and of course their online disinformation campaign, which has been a, perhaps its most insidious and effective tactic. Um, in recent years, there's many examples of democratic backsliding in Europe, for example, Poland, Turkey, Hungary. Um, I want to make a distinction here. It's something I'm asked a lot, and it often gets conflated in policy circles. Um, the effects of the financial and refugee crisis and EU skepticism, uh, they had different consequences. In some countries, um, those I just mentioned, the consequence has been increased authoritarianism and a deterioration of democracy. Um, Brexit, though, does not necessarily reflect a decline in the democratic process. Democracy in the UK still remains strong. Um, but we can talk, if you want to, about how Russia may have played a role in influencing that outcome. Um, so both the US and the UK have seen grave consequences due to Russian influence. Um, they you know, stoked the Brexit vote um, and infamously meddled in our own election. Um, so it should be in our collective interest to push back against Russian aggression and influence. Uh, so I'll now turn to the central question of today, how Brexit will influence the transatlantic alliance and democracy building, and can we still st count on British support? Uh, the UK will leave the European Union on January 31st, but the process of defining the new relationship with Europe will take a while. Um, they will need to determine what the new relationship will look like, and that needs to be um, thought through in many dimensions. Um, but, you know, the UK still remains in a lot of political institutions, NATO, Council of Europe, the Organization for S Cooperation and Security in Europe, um, so there may be, as Damir talked about, a, a necessary weakening of the EU as uh, an institution. Um, but I would also note that the UK was for the enlargement of the EU, not because it wanted 
kind of a bigger, uh, more integrated EU, it was the opposite. It, it thought that that would lead to deeper integration, but it could still extract the benefits of what the UK wanted out of the EU. Um, so there's a lot of uncertainty right now, but I, I wanted us to focus on the fact that there could also be a window of opportunity. Um, I think it would be a positive if uh, Britain shifted its focus towards NATO as a main foreign policy tool. Um, and the US role here will be really critical. And it'll be really critical at a tough time in American politics. Um, that, you know, the current administration has not been a reliable supporter of NATO. And I, I can't even tell you how many, you know, complaints I get from the Europeans and even within you know, our, our own government about the main thing that they've been trying to um, stave off is that the, our U.S. administration will cause some sort of chaos at any NATO summit. Um, but nonetheless, uh, for this administration and whichever administration comes next, um, working with the U.K. and Europe to strengthen NATO, that will be very important, I believe. Um, I thought it was deeply unhelpful how Macron said that NATO is brain dead um, and that Europe must go its own way. It's just, it's not, it's not practical. It uh, won't help us get anywhere near solving the problems of today. Let's look at the time. Um, one other note, Trump is very unpopular in the UK. Um, he is friends with Boris Johnson, but managing that friendship is gonna be a challenge for Boris Johnson. Um, he'll, on the one hand, try to take advantage of that good relationship, but on the other, hand, he'll have to be showing his people that he's not following Trump's lead too often. Um, so uh, on the other hand, it's Trump, it seems to be Trump's instincts to really want to strengthen bilateral relationships, but if he does so at the detriment of the collective transatlantic one, um, I, I think that we will be in for a rocky road as, as far as um, our collective security. Um, because really only a strong NATO alliance can hamper Russian influence from the outside and within. Um, it seems from, you know, some recent actions I've been tracking that the UK government, government seems willing to continue to main, remain engaged on Central Europe, um, which is something that it has been aligned with Germany and the US with, um, and encouraging a shared values path. So I, I hope and believe that will continue. Um, they've announced that they're gonna stay uh, in Ukraine for another year three years with orbit, Operation Orbital. Um, so a final point I'll make is one that I always make um, with as my role uh, as the director of the Bipartisan Transatlantic Democracy Working Group. Um, the alliance needs to rededicate itself to its values. Um, it's become very transactional and Trump talking about um, how much money each member needs to give takes away from what its central purpose was, and it was that the world is safer with the US and Europe working together to defend democracy and our collective security. Um, so in conclusion, the US and Europe need to work together to see now that Brexit does not fail. Uh, it will be hard, but the time is now to build a strong foundation for this rearranged relationship. Margaret Thatcher back in 97, Again, ahead of her time, caution that we don't sufficiently appreciate our good fortune to live in our democratic countries. In a way, that's a simple summation of how we arrived at our current precarious inflection point, uh, with democracy being challenged by authoritarianism. We forgot that democracy is a process, it's not an end state. It needs continuous inputs, review, feedback, nurturing. Um, so if democracy is to prevail in fighting off challenges from Russia, China, authoritarianism, it's because people, all of us, citizens are willing to fight and use all available space to press for freedom. And it because, it's because our democracies show that we can deliver. Thank you. All right, great, thank you everyone. Um, I'm just gonna take the typical moderator prerogative and ask one question and then open it up and hopefully we'll be able to, I might have a couple of more questions I'm gonna put in along the way. We're all geeks, uh, basically, uh, with the exception of Professor Clemens, the four of us drove down here in a car today and like, I was wondering what song lists, you know, we could, we could listen to and we just end up sitting around talking about European politics and American politics the whole time. So there's all kinds of stuff we can talk about today, but you know, we're here for you. So uh, a little impeachment talk. A little impeachment talk. Yeah, yeah you, do, you, you can't talk American politics. So I'm talking about impeachment right now. So, um, but uh, you know, uh, thank you everyone for your remarks. And you know, uh, the first one that, that comes to mind, you know, Damir and I, 
had the fortune of, good fortune, of interviewing uh, historian Andrew Roberts, um, who wrote uh, another uh, door-stopping book, a uh, biography of, of Winston Churchill, several, one on Winston Churchill uh, most recently, which I have to recommend. And it, was, it was highly touted with, uh, you know, on, on all sides about being a, a, a great biography. And during this interview back in uh, September, you know, kind of the talking about where, where the United Kingdom was, was, was headed, and Ro Roberts is, is a Brexiteer. Um, you know, he's like, look, if there's anything that's keeping uh, you know, Boris Johnson up at night, it's whether or not he's going to be able to conclude a, a free trade agreement with the United States after January 31st. And uh, Professor Clem, is, you, know, you, you raise a great point, a um, couple of them, but one of them certainly being that, that Germany and Belgium and, and, and the Netherlands all in particular, um, they have a real stake in, in this as well. And you know, I, I, what do you, uh, with all that in mind and what's at stake, I guess the, the first question is, and I open this up to the panel, um, you know, what challenges do you see ahead in relation vis-a-vis -vis Whitehall and the White House being able to conclude a free trade agreement? And considering, if, if, if we agree with the idea that, that, that Germany and Belgium and the Netherlands, all of which, you know, certainly Germany, the other ones, you know, these aren't, they're, they're not pinch hitters in the European Union, they're important nations, want to ensure that, that trade keeps going as well. You know, uh, what kind of prospects do we see for this being concluded the challenges, the prospects, or success. And the second part of that is, what does that tell us then about the importance of trade and investment and overall economy, when once again we're focused on what the European Union is going back to its origins? Well, I'm glad you opened that up for the whole panel because <laughs> I have no idea. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, in all honesty, political economy is not my is not my field in international trade. So I'm 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 uh, kind of improvising as I think about this. But if, if by you know chances of completing this, you mean the EU Britain agreement? Then, okay, the EU Britain agreement theoretically is supposed to be done this year, this calendar year. That's the deadline Boris Johnson has set. The EU is very skeptical, and precisely for some of these you know conflicting interests, it it, it seems unlikely. Ursula von der Leyen has said it's almost impossible to think of concluding this agreement in a year. And of course, that deadline, British deadlines have been a little bit more flexible in the past few years than uh, than they like to pretend. So it might well be pushed back. You know, again, the the. Uh, the depth of, of uh, certainly from the European Union perspective, the depth of British self-delusion about what they can achieve in these negotiations is, is pretty deep, uh, both with regard to Ireland and, and conducting that whole uh, piece of the uh, puzzle uh, and, and building it successfully, and then managing to get access to the single market. It's simply something that these European countries have too much of a stake in preserving. On the other hand, particularly for these countries that have a high-stake trade relationship with the United Kingdom. They don't see prospective opportunities elsewhere. Yes, there might be, with the absence of Britain inside the European Union, corresponding advantages for them elsewhere inside the European Union without the competition from the UK, but it's unlikely, as far as I understand it, to offset what they lose in their own bilateral trade relationships with the United Kingdom. So it's a, it's a real stress point for them. If the second question is a, a UK-US relationship, there I'm really out of my depth. And I think it's probably not gotten to this point an awful lot of thought at the highest levels in Washington. It certainly <laughs> has gotten thought at the working <laughs> levels. But I, right, at, the, at the highest levels, I doubt it, it's at, at this point um, percolated through. I mean, the, the Trump administration seems to regard tariffs almost as an end in themselves as part of its trade policy and doesn't really have a grander design than that, except for using tariffs as a kind of means of flexing America's muscle as, a, as an importer, more or less. Uh, the fact that everybody sells to us gives us that, that kind of leverage. What that means for Boris Johnson trying to work out a relationship is exactly right. You know, he has to do these simultaneously or roughly simultaneously. He has this relationship with, you know, sort of the Trump whisperer in, in the United Kingdom. On the other hand, if he gets taken advantage of and you get these chlorine-infested American chickens on British dining tables and so forth, uh, it right away causes him domestic political problems. Although, again, he has a very secure position for four or five years in that respect. Um, 
I have to say we've underrated him a little bit in the last year or two in terms of his political savvy. I, 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 I have no particular substantive reason for saying this, but I, I would give him better than 50-50 odds of carrying off both the relationship with the EU and the relationship with the U.S., but don't, don't press me further. Because I can't. I, I, I will not. I think that, 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 that's, that's pretty. You know, I, I very much agree that um, you know, there are a lot of people that, that just, you know, crazy hair Johnson. People don't want to take him seriously. And he's shown himself a, a political, level of political adroitness that has been uh, remarkable. I, I mean, you, remember, you remember when we talked to Andrew Roberts? I mean, that's the, what, what struck me about that. Uh, we were just having breakfast with him, recording the conversation. And he was so bullish on, 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 uh, um, uh, uh, on Johnson. I mean, yeah. it, it took me aback at that point. He, he was talking about Johnson's sort of almost Churchillian uh, qualities. Mm -hmm. And okay, and if you read Andrew Roberts, you can you can look up some of these articles that he's written, and he, he's he's been a booster like that. I remember walking away from that breakfast, being like, "Wow, that's a that's a hard bitten Brexiteer who's really you know drank the Kool Aid. He's he he's got some 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 uh, some real belief in this." But you know, to your point, I it's he keeps sort of you know no one thought he could even renegotiate the. Uh, um, the backstop. Now, arguably, he renegotiated back to the original right. proposal that the, <laughs> right. the Europeans gave him. But still, that's political acumen to be able to then sell that back as a win, and that tells you something about. But that's politics, you know. I mean, it, it's being able to. And do this politi political ruthlessness <coughs> in selling out the Ulster Unionists. That's who right. Are, uh, that's they're, right. They're, they're, yeah. He's, he's and ruthless. but the calculus to be able right. to see that that he could he could do that. Uh, the only thing I'd I'd, I'd say, uh, you know, just to to build on on what you said, Professor Clements, is. Um, the, the story this morning uh, was that uh, the Brits are, are, are going to allow Huawei in uh, to build their 5G stuff. And uh, the response from the White House has been sputtering anger at this point about, you know, um, at this. And I don't know, I, I was looking at the New York Times report this as we were driving up here, and they said something along the lines of, well, this is not over. We'll still figure out a way to work this out, and more pressure, more pressure. Um, I think with that, pushes at is um, another reality of this. And I think it is, it's, it's on Boris Johnson to navigate it. But, you know, we as Americans need to keep this in mind. He's going to be navigating it. And the, the promise of Brexit, at least for Brits, uh, is this idea that they will be able to balance and do stuff. You know, we had a, a panel at, at the magazine uh, uh, last night in Washington. We're talking about uh, democracy promotion. Uh, and one of the, the, the panelists mentioned something along the lines of, um, uh, you know, the authoritarian challenge, uh, which is, you know, in many ways uh, the handmaiden of how we talk about now uh, great power competition uh, here in the U.S. Um, the Europeans don't see China the same way necessarily as we do. And I think we can see that uh, raising its head a little bit with the Brits who are going to be more pragmatic, perhaps, on some of these issues. I think that's one of the, the big challenges uh, uh, going ahead. And you see that with, uh, with the Huawei thing today, is that, that you know, I, we don't know all the details of how the deliberations happen, but I, I think it's an important data point to, to look at how, how these things are going to develop. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, the only other data point I have is uh, our, the gentleman who does a podcast uh, at the magazine, also sort of books podcast, Richard Aldous, he's a professor at Bard. Um, uh, he's British, he went back, uh, was in London, and his impression was, again, of Boris Johnson as this sort of very optimistic and pragmatic driving force now. So I, I, I guess that you'll see a lot of that, a lot of sort mm -hmm. of uh, uh, shuffling and uh, maneuvering for advantage. And I, you know, I think that, that presents the, the set of challenges for us in the U.S. of how we, how we, how we approach this. Absolutely. Susan. Um, I'll just <laughs> jump in on that. I, I spoke to a couple of people who he went to school with and they said, you know, don't focus on the hair, that's a distraction. <laughs> he's actually very shrewd and, you know, he, they said, in part you don't get it because you're not British, but he makes a lot of sense in the British context. He went to all the right schools, he's from the right family, you know, his family was not, you know, politically in line with him, but they all got behind him when they saw that that was their route to power. Um, so, you know, I think their view is he plays off this kind of happy-go-lucky messy guy persona to his own benefit. Um, I'm also not you know, a political economist, but uh, just a couple of points to make. Uh, Steve Mnuchin announced that he thought a free trade agreement with the US and UK would be possible within the next year. I'd wager Trump would love if that happened before November. Mm -hmm. um, I also think it's not that likely. Um, there's a couple of issues of contention um, that have 
stood in the way. Um, one is a new tax on revenues by big tech firms by the UK, which the US has angrily called discriminatory. Um, and, you know, Trump, you know, has kind of been tariff man when the UK didn't give in to our pressure on that. Uh, they threatened tariffs on U UK car makers. Um, Huawei and 5G is another one. Um, and another big one for the UK is um, a possible inclusion of the National Health Service on the trade deal. Um, and one thing that I think is going to be hard for the for Britain to come to terms with, um, I've read a lot of uh, articles of them being fairly optimistic about what this will mean for them. And I think there's going to be a kind of coming to earth moment where that they realize that if they want this deal with the US, they're going to have a lot less clout in the deal. Um, <coughs> <clears throat> so whether or not that can happen, you know, in an expedited time frame, I'm I'm doubtful. Um, but you know, we'll see. We'll see. All right. Well, you have the man for the job in White House, so anyone <laughs> can do it. Great. So with that, we'll uh, we'll open it up for uh, for questions, and uh, hopefully the kind of answers that will leave your question somewhat satisfied. Um, Okay. All right. Do we have the gentleman in the front? Thank you. So I guess my question, I know, I think Professor Clemens, you mentioned Sinn Féin in Ireland, and you can look in the past couple months that some left-wing parties have actually performed fairly well. Like I know in Austria, the Greens did pretty well in the European Parliament elections. Greens did pretty well, but typically when we're talking about the European Union, we tend to be looking at like the rise of right-wing populist parties and kind of determining how they're impacting the EU. So how do you foresee these more activist left-wing organizations affecting you know, the European project and public opinion towards it? There, there has been a, a bit of a resurgence, it's a, a bit of a growth of center-left parties in the form of kind of alternative parties like the Greens generally feasting on the remains of social democrats though. So the, the, the net <laughs> increase in terms of the center left vote is actually not that impressive in most of these countries. Uh, the social democrats and the socialists are in such crisis in most of these countries that people looking for an alternative that isn't on the right are voting for the Greens. And what's also intriguing about that is very often because of the growth of populist right wing parties on one flank and the kind of decline of the conventional left on the other side, we're seeing this kind of increasing governments of, of weird combinations that 10 or 20 years ago would have been unimaginable of conservative parties with the Greens. I mean, we have one now in Austria. It's conceivable we'll have one in Ireland. It's quite conceivable we'd have one in Germany where the Greens are on the verge of eclipsing the Christian Democrats for the first time in the polls. So it doesn't really help in the sense of stabilizing the EU in the sense that you have this kind of relatively fragile coalitions of center and center left parties in the middle facing a kind of vacuum on the left and still a fairly substantial growth of populist parties on the right. Now, there have been a few setbacks. I mean, in Greece, the elections were went a little better in terms of the traditional parties there and uh, certainly in, in Denmark. Uh, so they're, they're some, of the, some of the populist right-wing parties have, have peaked and, and maybe especially those that have been in government for a while have, have suffered as oftentimes governing parties do, a little bit of a voter backlash. But some of the big players, obviously, Italy, despite what's happened in the last couple of days, uh, the, the, the Italian party is, is, is going generally uh, in, a, in, in an upward direction. France, we just don't know what's going to come out of Macron's reforms and what that does to, to the, center right, uh, the, the far right, the populist right. The AFD is not going to go away in Germany at all. It may peak at around 18 percent or something. So it, it un, you know, it, it mixes the deck a little bit more and makes it even a little bit more unpredictable in terms of how you put governments together in Europe. But I don't think it returns us to a kind of stable situation with a, uh, a strong left. If I could just, just add to that real quick, because I think there's it's something that the, the Dahmer and I have, have talked about in the past, and I think it's important, that's important to underline, is that you know, nationalism is neither right nor left. And you know, and populist nationalism I and mean, populism is when you start to, in my estimate, when you start to really talk about it. it it's, it, it's it, it's a series of tools. It, it's how you share. It, it's an, how you, you talk about a certain narrative, and it, it may be nationalistic. And I I agree for what it's worth that you know there's probably been some peaking going on, but there was something that was also overlooked in in much of the Western press, 
and that was back in, t in fall of 2018 and into early 2019, what happened in Macedonia. We're well, now it's North Macedonia, but back then it was still the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia in certain circles. And given a referendum as to, the t as to changing their name, which would then allow that country on a path to joining NATO and then, at least until recently, a clearer path about joining the European Union, um, Roughly one third of the electorate turned out to vote and they voted yes. And most everyone else stayed home. It's because for them, suddenly becoming a North Macedonian, something very different than being a Macedonian. And I raise that because what I'm trying to underline is that what we're seeing in some of these countries in terms of like the, 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 the very negative populist nationalist rhetoric, that may be peaking, that, that's gonna ebb and flow. But there's, there's a certain level of national identity and the emotional response that the people have to that, the, the, the attachment that they have to it, which is going to con continue in my estimate in European politics and whether that gets manipulated um, by bad forces or it's able to be cultivated for a more democratic and stable Europe, that remains to be seen. I mean, the only other thing to <coughs> maybe complicate your category, right, is what do you mean by left? <coughs> uh, is, uh, um, is Macron on the left? He's pro-European. Uh, he's populist, actually. I mean, he came up, he destroyed the French political system completely, founded it, uh, founded a party that's named basically after me, En Marche, Emmanuel Macron. That's not a, not a coincidence. The man's a bit of a megalomaniac. He's, he's, he's doing stuff. Um, but he's pro-European, so then we, we tend to think of him as, you know, uh, I guess one of the good guys as opposed to one of the destructive guys. But in a way, it's, it's part of the same sort of... Um, uh, product of things. I mean, the interesting thing about the Greens is that, that uh, they are displacing the Social Democrats across the spectrum, but they're not exactly displacing them. They're also sort of more urban, uh, centered around things that, that urban voters are, are more interested in. So, I mean, you know, the, the, and then you have Jeremy Corbyn, and you have Corbynism, which failed so spectacularly this time. Maybe that's the closest thing to uh, a serious left that had a real leftist argument in the maybe traditional sense of what one might mean by right and left. But I just, I, I throw that out there just to, to maybe confuse the question a little bit because what, what do we mean by left and right anymore? Um, to a certain extent, we can talk about pro-European and anti-European parties. Uh, we can talk about populists and I guess centrists to a certain extent, but the center is being voided uh, in most of these places and you're getting these kinds of strange coalitions, um, the stability of which is untried right now, but you know, it's also a parliamentary system. It's very different from how things work here. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to sort of throw that out uh, to complicate it a bit. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. I know I really shouldn't ask a question, but it's, it's so exciting. Um, <laughs> so I'm gonna quickly throw in two. Uh, one, one is uh, Scotland. So we haven't talked at all about the SNP and you know, some people fear that the dynamic is already set such that the Scottish Nationalist Party would almost be forced to call another referendum that has been promised by the party. Uh, and with the decline of labor in Scotland, it seems like there could be a new uh, electoral outcome there, which of course would really be complicated <laughs> in the middle of all these other negotiations. You know, you have to deal with uh, Scottish uh, nationalist uh, potential uh, desire to leave the United Kingdom. We worried about that a little bit at William & Mary because our joint degree program with <laughs> St. Andrews will be affected, so we, we uh, talk with our Scottish uh, colleagues a lot. Um, so I'm curious what you think about that, whether that's a realistic prospect or not that much of a worry. Uh, in the end, maybe people realize Scotland is too closely tied you know, to really undergo complete separation or re-entry into the EU, but you know, certainly it's been raised. And then the second question is totally different. It's about the US, and you know, I, I happen to be a transatlantic person, very happy you're all here, uh, cards on the table. I think Susan's concluding statement is exactly what I would want to see. But if you look at the Democratic Party today, or if you look at Trump, there's just not very much of that in the campaign. I mean, Biden might be the closest thing, but it's mostly as a way of restoring the status quo ante, right? I mean, I was there with Obama, we like these allies, we, it's important, but nothing like the ringing rhetoric you know, that we, we just heard, I would say. And that's not Biden's style exactly anyway. Uh, and then there's Buttigieg, who might be the other person who claims with foreign policy credentials to have some interest in restoring alliances. And you know, for Warren, for Sanders, for really almost all the other candidates, Klobuchar really, I haven't heard a whole bunch uh, about this being a high priority. So I kind of wonder where it comes from in American politics if it doesn't come from the candidates who are now competing. <laughs> 
I'll just take a quick stab at Scotland because American politics is way too messy and complicated for me to ever understand. So, um, but I, I, you're right; the pressure will grow. But it's a real dilemma that when I say she, obviously the leader of the Scottish National Party is under because on the one hand, plainly the, the indignation about Scotland being dragged out against the will of over 60% of the voters is, is great and it's still there and it's summer, is simmering. Uh, on the other hand, obviously not everybody who voted for Scottish independence in 2014 necessarily was opposed to Brexit and a lot of the uh, sort of vote that she would have to get to get to 50% in a, in a referendum on independence would, would mix the deck uh, in a way that's really hard to predict. So I think, again, so much of it, it comes back to Boris Johnson, how he handles this in terms of his majority in, in the United Kingdom. I mean, he has won parts of Northern England that, that the Conservative Party has never held, didn't do terribly well in Scotland, but some of the same issues that he might need to sort of tread softly on in order to keep his support in Northern England and keep those seats that are really his seats might affect uh, the, the way his government is viewed in Scotland. If he goes the full Thatcher route and basically cuts Scotland out of the United Kingdom, then of course he is gonna feed that resentment even more. It's still a dilemma though, because however much the uh, Scots lose in terms of uh, membership in the EU economically, obviously the rest of the UK is a much bigger trading partner. So mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm really curious to see what happens with that, but again, I think a lot of it, the, the ball is in Boris Johnson's court. <coughs> I, uh, I mean, question for you, Professor Clemens. I mean, w the European Union wouldn't <coughs> grant them fast track is the other part. Yeah. So then it's like an independent Scotland sitting outside. Uh, <coughs> that seems like the tough one. And the reason the Europeans wouldn't do it is uh, Catalonia and Spain. I mean, if nothing else, that's, that's the one that's going to block them. Never mind the fact that they're not letting other aspirant countries into the, into the Union at this point. I mean, maybe they'd want to play some sort of hardball on this and say, oh, well, if you don't concede on this trade thing here, maybe we'd, but I can't even imagine that yeah. that would really work out. So, so that's a really tough one on that. I, I, I imagine that, uh, that uh, Nicola Sturgeon actually knows this and that's why she's sort of holding her fire even though it's kind of popular. Um, but that's, that's, uh, that's my instinct on that. I mean, Susan, I don't know if you want to talk about domestic politics and we can jump into that. There's plenty <laughs> to talk about there, but go ahead. Yeah, we had a good debate in the car on the <laughs> way down. Um, and I wanted to kind of go further with my argument. I'm actually, and I think in my remarks, I, I'm not a, advocating for returning to the status quo. I'm actually advocating for a rededicated to the, the values and that our security and our democracy are, are intertwined. And I think that there, I think that all of us have maybe been too small in our thinking that we need to be open to bigger ideas. That um, if we believe um, that democracy is worth fighting for. We need to, again, prove to the new generation how it can deliver. Um, to those who it has failed, we need to understand that there has been a lot that has gone wrong and understand why. Um, we need to show why it is the system that can provide dynamic solutions to modern challenges. We didn't even talk about you know, climate, that's another one. So you know, I think we all believe in our hearts that you know, a, a dictatorship and authoritarianism um, you know, closing off information. It's obvious why, you know, assist, we're going, you know, with China right now with the coronavirus, um, why a closed system is so dangerous. Um, but I think that there needs to be a much bigger rethink about what could the new architecture be as long as we're grounded in, in the values and showing how democracy can deliver. But be thinking, of, you know, if the EU is going to be weaker, we don't necessarily need to fight to make the EU stronger. Mm -hmm. We need to think about what architecture then helps us fend off those things that we really believe to be threats. And I do believe China and Russia are um, geopolitical threats for the US and Europe. Um, and that we need to then decide how we're gonna work together, how we're gonna address new challenges, um, cyber in particular. NATO is a good example. It hasn't really figured out how it is going to deal with cyber challenges. Um, the uh, democracy that it is so vulnerable to uh, manipulation from the outside and um, what what that means, how do we really address that together? Um, so there's a lot of big questions and I, I don't think that we have all of the right tools or the right architecture dating all the way back to World War II. Um, so then if you talk about that, uh, you know, in terms of the United States, we're obviously in the middle of a big, you know, 
dividing up of our own political system. The Republican Party is very different from what it was, you know, pre Donald Trump. The Democratic Party, I, I liked how the New York Times decided to, for the first time, endorse two candidates, both Warren and Klobuchar, and they said it's not our job to decide, you know, what the De Democratic Party can't decide for itself. Um, and, you know, whether it's more progressive or whether it's, you know, kind of more moderate incrementalism um, remains to be seen. Um, so that doesn't really answer the question, but it puts more questions out there, I think. Because I'd get in trouble with my executive director as president of the U.S. Sheriff Alliance to not give some attempt at answering Steve's question, but it's, I'm actually going to turn it on its head a little bit, and that's part of what we do. Um, one of the reasons that Scott and I established USEA is because we got tired of sitting around Washington for years, listening in an echo chamber, listening to everyone talk about why it was important to work with Europe, and we got tired of sitting around watching Congress just give lip service to the importance of working with our European partners and doing nothing to talk about it with their constituencies back home, wherever home may be. So we decided that we needed to start coming out and talking to folks like yourselves who have taken the time to, to, to listen to this today, to listen to our, this, this panel here, and become a little better informed, just sort of like what's going on with this relationship. But ultimately, along the lines of what Susan was saying, and you know, kind of the sense that you know, we are in the 21st century, and you know, we, we were very successful in setting up a world order at the end of the Second World War that's brought unprecedented security, prosperity, and understanding and respect for individual human rights around the world. But the question is really like, and go forward, you're not gonna answer it today, but think about it. What do you expect from a transatlantic relationship? I mean, this is 50% this is of the world's GDP is derived from the transatlantic economy, 50%. This is an immensely integrated economy. And NATO has thus far served as a pretty successful, I dare say, bedrock of security on a global scale. All right, so let's recognize that and, and you know, try to dig into the kind of conversations that we're having today, but I hope going forward, if we come back here or elsewhere, you know, that we get to have a, a forum where we can hear from folks like yourselves about what, you ha what kind of expectations you have from Europe um, as, part of the as a member, as the United States being a member of the transatlantic community. So I believe this gentleman had a question previously. Yes, sir. Actually, it's almost a follow-up to what you're, you just said. Um, I graduated uh, 20 years before Professor Clemens in 1960, so I'm the real old generation. <coughs> and uh, back in those days, um, by the way, with apologies, uh, not from William and Mary, from Fordham. Um, but. Uh, Europe was still just, I would call, a geographic entity with a lot of different nations, hadn't quite figured out uh, how to get together. Today, I see Europe very much as a very vibrant, with its ups and downs, but a very vibrant socio-political, socio-economic entity. Uh, I say this in part because looking at the young people around here and the young Europeans, <coughs> um, uh, young Europeans today, and please correct me, that's what I'd like to hear from you. Uh, they may see themselves still as a Danish, which is my wife's family, mm -hmm. or some other German or that, but they also see themselves as Europeans. Now, admittedly, not uh, as it is 155 years later, where I think most Virginians would say, yes, we're first Americans and then we're Virginians. Mm -hmm. uh, that is, is quite striking also, and. Uh, I'm sorry, you get your name, the, uh, uh, you mentioned about the, uh, the Trump administration. I, I should repeat, I'm a, I'm a retired Foreign Service officer, so that's why you're hearing me with a long-winded speech. Uh, the, the issue of this administration, in part because of the way the young Europeans are, we are less and less important to them. Mm -hmm. And very much they think they've got to sort of look in their own, and that's even with Russia as a renewed as adversary. Britain, somewhat different, but uh, Steve will know about this. We have, uh, many of you know about the, the William and Mary Harriman uh, fellowships for the Foreign Service, and I hope some of you will be applying for that when you're juniors or seniors. I had the opportunity to speak to the returning one from uh, the 2019 fellow. His comment was the same, uh, similar, while the Brits don't think of themselves as British, or actually, let me qualify that don't think of themselves English and Euro perhaps European, mm -hmm. but they have still very much Remainers, most of them. 
What are your, your views of that? <coughs> well, uh, I'm going to turn it over to the panel, but I just there's there's something that a, a realization that a colleague of mine who um, had to flee Bosnia in in 1992 when the, the the fighting began there in April of that year. You know, we're at a point right now in, in, in sort of like common European identity and what drives that, that Europe right now is blessed with a generation that has seen no violent, taking Ukraine out of Europe for a moment, if you will, let's put Ukraine aside, but Western and Central Europe at least, having not seen any violent conflict. You have an entire generation of Europeans with the exception of those young men and women that volunteered and or one way or the other fought in, in Iraq or Afghanistan, but no European has had to fight a war on European soil since the dissolution of Yugoslavia. And I think that it, my estimate, my, my colleagues, my friends' insight on this, I think says a lot about you know, how also how Europeans see themselves. There's an identity question, but sort of like part of that, there, there was this thing called NATO, and there was, a, there was a Soviet threat, and everyone was on board with that. And the, the concept of fighting a land, of any kind of land war being fought right now in, in Europe is so distant from, the, from the, the youngest generation's minds. And what kind of impact does that also have on understanding about what am I first and foremost? My country, my a European, how does that all play out? So I just wanted to add that in there before turning it over to you all for your thoughts on. Well, I, I mean, uh, it's absolutely true that this sense of European identity uh, among younger generations is, is, is considerably stronger in a kind of implicit and tacit way. The trouble is it's become detached in some ways from the <coughs> specifics of the EU so that it's quite possible for people at one and the same time to enjoy all the benefits that come with this kind of free cross-border travel and all the benefits that come with the single market and particularly younger generations, but without developing or retaining any of the passion for the EU as a project that might have animated people 50 years ago. And this current crop of political leaders in, in Europe has is, is not been very effective at conveying that. Maybe it's impossible to. It's one of these paradoxes that when a policy like this generally succeeds, it, it loses its urgency and loses the credit that it deserves for it. And so in a way, uh, younger people recognize that after the fact, after a lot of them didn't show up for the Brexit vote, for example, recognize that in Britain. <laughs> um, and the same kind of little, little bit too late realization might uh, affect some other decisions that tend to be made. But you're absolutely right. Unfortunately, it doesn't, um, it doesn't help the EU as a set of institutions, in part because of all the incredible arcane complexity of the EU and, and, and part of some of the problems the, that the EU has generated that have already been mentioned in terms of the Greek debt crisis and so forth, that, that the negatives tend to outweigh the tacit positives, and the positives aren't attributed to the EU as an institution. So it's kind of a paradox. Um, Interesting. A couple of sort of, uh, I don't know, related points, but, but uh, on, on the, the domestic stuff, and I think why, why this project about uh, asking Americans to think about the U.S.-European relationship is so important is that I, so I, I wrote an article. I, it's not a really popular thing to say, but if you take a step back, there's actually been more, not more continuity, but some continuity between Obama and Trump on these issues. Um, that, uh, you know, the U.S., this is not, this didn't just happen that the U.S. is turning away from Europe. If you look at just the Ukraine stuff, the way that, uh, and again, you know, for different reasons, but Obama's rationale for sort of uh, outsourcing the Ukraine stuff to the Europeans was training wheels are coming off, guys. It's your it's your neighborhood. Deal with it. Um, but based on that was also a rationale of we're going to turn away to Asia. So you know part of all of this is now you know, what is the transatlantic relationship? No one has made the case. We've had uh, two su successive administrations that have that have basically declared mission accomplished. Let's get out of here. And so that's partly what's happening. I think this is what you are seeing. You're absolutely right that that Biden at best is the one saying like, well, okay, status quo ante. And to your credit, Susan, I think that's not enough. That's not, that's not, that's not gonna cut it, you know? Uh, I, I think that's one of my, I think many of our uh, great misgivings about the Biden administration, the Biden promise is this idea of, it's just nostalgia for something. Um, and even if you look at it, it's not even a kind of nostalgia that's worth being nostalgic about, you know? Um, so that's, that's on, on, on domestic politics. And I, I do think that, that insofar as uh, transatlanticism is important, it, it has, the case has to be made. Uh, the Cold War provided a certain case. Uh, it's important to remember that the Cold War was um, 
the argument was made in actually pretty hard security terms by you know people like Kennan and, and, and Truman administration. The human rights stuff came later um, and filled out this narrative, but arguably there was a very strong national security argument. I think you know uh, some of the stuff that, that, that Rich is talking about, the economic cooperation, these are the harder questions. This is not to say that <laughs> values are unimportant and shouldn't be part of it, they have to be. Uh, but I think that you know we need to be striving for that. Um, on the young people in Europe, um, in Central Eastern Europe in particular, there was an article uh, last week, maybe, Financial Times by Ivan Krastev. Um, I believe it was in the Financial Times, maybe in the New York Times, he writes in both places. But um, he made the case about demography and the rise of, of these kinds of parties, uh, especially in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, it's one of those somewhat studied, but not enough studied um, things, is to note that, that you know, where a lot of these parties come from, uh, there's a city country divide, there's a, uh, there's an Eastern Europe, uh, there's, so that operates in every country. You have a, a liberal mayor of Budapest right now, but, but Orban's party gets its, its strength from the countryside. You get the same sort of picture in Poland. But then you get, you know, Central and Eastern Europe as a whole, where uh, since the 1990s, the best and brightest have all gone west and have gotten educated. There hasn't been that much coming back. I'm originally from Croatia, uh, you know, got into the European Union. Uh, the brain drain is, is immense there now, immense. Everyone who can is leaving. Um, so, and that creates an opportunity for this kind of anti-European nationalist appeal, I think, that is happening in all of these places. And it kind of makes sense to a certain extent. You're, you're making an appeal to people saying, look around you. You, everything that you think contains your country, your nation, this nationalism, it's dying around you, you're under threat. So then it's easy to fill in the blank on what that threat is, whether <laughs> it's migrants, you know, whether it's, it's the European Union that's taking your best and brightest, and you make the case to the people that you are the authentic ones, you stayed behind on the land while, while those, those profligate young ones, the Europeans, the ones you're saying that have a European identity, they've abandoned you. So, you're, so that's part of the dimension of this kind of politics that's happening. Um, that's oversimplifying it, I think, for the, all of Europe. It's wherever you look, it's different. But those are some trends that you can look at. Um, and that, you know, that economic thing plays out also, I think, in the Brexit debate and how, how Brexit happened. Um, I have, have a few disjointed reflections on your question. Um, you know, as I mentioned in my remarks, a silver line at a, of Brexit is that it has caused those in other countries to appreciate the EU and realize that they're not wanting to get out of it. Um, so on the level of individuals I've talked to, I think that they are able to think about layered identities, that they have a national identity and that they have a broader European identity that they're proud of and that they appreciate the benefits of that, particularly among young people. Um, kind of on the national leader level, it's, it's really complicated because you have Viktor Orban, who's one of the main critics of the EU, but he's also one of the biggest recipients of EU funds. And uh, it's a very complicated relationship where the EU can't go after that too much, even though they know that he's siphoning it all off, a large chunk of it off for his cronies. So there's a very complicated relationship. It's not that the EU can just go away, because there's a lot of benefits that hidden and um, out in the open that um, are keeping people connected to it. Um, you know, as far as the U.S., um, you know, I hear a lot from people that they understand the difference between the administration and the American people. You know, initially they thought kind of, well, this too shall pass, pa this too shall pass, um, that, you know, the Europeans have a longer memory of, you know, various ups and downs with the U.S. relationship and believe that, you know, we'll get back on track. I think they're a little disappointed to realize that this Trump experiment is, could go on for a second term. Um, but they, you know, on the diplomat level, they've said to me, like, yeah, he's, you know, it's really confusing to have to deal with him, but, you know, in practice, the changes have not been as great as we might have feared. So it hasn't been cataclysmic yet. It's, um, you know, it's unsettling and, um, you know, we're working our way through it, but um, we can survive this. Um, German Marshall Fund did a, a report, which I recommend, and it was on kind of future of Europe. I'm going to extrapolate this to the transatlantic alliance, but there were five different scenarios of where this could go, and only two of them were kind of positive, and only one of them was actually positive. 
in terms of how the transatlantic alliance um, kind of rededicates itself. One, they called the shotgun wedding. And what that meant was that there's an actual escalation and external threat from a Russia or a China that cause us to realize that there's an existential threat and we must work more closely together. So right now it's all kind of academic, we can debate it, but if we really need it and we need to call upon NATO to protect us, all of a sudden it's gonna matter a whole lot more. And then second is kind of this European spring idea that the uh, younger generations will find their own, you know, will need to fight for freedom in the same way we had 89. And, you know, I was recently talking to Václav Bartuszka, who is one of the uh, student leaders of the uh, of Prague Revolution, Velvet Revolution in 89. And he said, yeah, I'm still hopeful. I know that we can get through this. He said, and, you know, I use hope in the Václav Havel expression of it, that I hope not because I know that a certain outcome is going to happen, but I know that even if, you know, that I have a lot of costs, and I'm butchering this quote, by the way, but, <laughs> but you believe that you're working on behalf of, of the right goal. All right, we have time for just one more question, if there is one out there. Thank you. Right on. Um, hi. I was just wondering if there's a possibility of Britain uh, leaning towards a closer trade agreement with the countries in the Commonwealth instead of alliance with the U.S. Because I don't think that was touched upon. Oh. Sorry, one question. Uh, whether uh, about the prospect of um, greater British in uh, integration with countries of the Commonwealth as, as, as an alternative. Not a lot of experts on the Commonwealth out here. Yeah, yeah. Um, to be honest, my impression of the Commonwealth is that as a trading entity, it's never really gotten off the ground. I mean, the diversity within the Commonwealth is so considerable, it's remained this kind of vestigial tie to the crown, this vestigial tie to the British Empire, but without a real lot of economic integration or economic potential for integration. And so I don't know that that's being discussed widely as an alternative, given the size and the importance of the U.S. market, and obviously you'd be negotiating with one partner. Uh, in the case of the U.S., um, even if it's an unpredictable partner at the moment, I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't hear a lot of discussion of the Commonwealth as the alternative outlet for, uh, for Britain. Um, obviously, always that symbolic identification and the pleasant memory that conjures up of, if you like, all of the world being pink uh, on the maps. Uh, but I don't know that economically it's as. Uh, as central of uh, uh, an organization. Yeah, I mean, maybe the, the, the best way is to think of our friend Andrew Roberts again. <laughs> it's in the sense that, that it's, uh, I think there's a, there's a, there's a um, strand of thinking both here and in, in, in Britain, uh, this, this wanted idea of the Anglosphere, which is not an institution, but it's, uh, you know, it's this idea that, that all the Anglophone countries can, can basically come together on something like this. Is there something to it? I, I, I tend to think that there is, you know, that, that in, at, it's not that, that they're going to get, uh, that Britain's gonna get a, a free lunch out of the US or, or Canada or anything like that, but, but maybe that, that in the grand scheme of things and trying to negotiate a very complicated, complex trade agreement, uh, some of these cultural affinities and the ability to understand each other maybe makes it a little easier on the margins, maybe. Um, it's not, it's not that this is that anything like the Anglosphere is something that is consciously uh, ties these countries together and necessarily leads to anything, but um, you still sort of take a step back and you see how a lot of these countries end up cooperating. I mean, especially in security issues, uh, intelligence sharing. Um, I, I, I don't think it's, it would, be, it would be too rash to just completely dismiss it out of hand as something that could, that could potentially um, lead to something. But uh, uh, yeah, it's a complicated question, and I'm, I'm not sure institutionally the Commonwealth, as such, as Professor said, is uh, is going to make that much of a difference. And who knows where Megxit will take us? <laughs> <laughs> they have to earn money somehow. So <laughs> um, I, I would just add to that because it, it is something that, that, that we, we've had some discussions about Damir and I and others. You know, there, there, there's less talk about the Commonwealth, and there's more talk about increased increased cooperation between the five eyes. You know, so Canada, the United States, New Zealand, Australia. Um, who's the fifth? I just forgot. Did I just 
Canada, Australia. Okay, yeah, I'm right. Okay, yeah, I got everyone. Sorry, forgive me. Um, I want to make sure. I want to make sure everyone was included there. Uh, you know, w when you look at what's happening right now with the United States and the sale of F-35s to to Turkey and how that's been put on hold because Erdogan made an incredibly short-sighted decision in an effort to pander to Vladimir Putin's Kremlin and the purchase of the S-400 missiles, it gives you a taste about what's in store in terms of one country or one company rather selling. It's, it's highly specialized and technological military equipment to another. And when, a, when countries like Germany, as, we, as was raised earlier today, are kind of like, well, you know, we kind of going to work with the Chinese, we're going to kind of buy some of this stuff. Like, what that, you know, that can lead to, on, on one hand, it could lead to a bunker mentality that's going to start to impact who's selling weapons within one country and whether or not you're going to see a closing in of the five eyes, or maybe not, because Lockheed Martin didn't, and their shareholders aren't in business so they can just sell weapons to a handful of countries. They want to sell as many weapons as they possibly can because they want to turn a profit. That's what they exist for. But why do I raise all of that? Because that is going to have economic implications and whatever kind of ties that we're going to have going forward. And could that, could that lead to some cohesion within certain Commonwealth states? You know, I think it's a little too early to tell. But I hope that what we've been able to do today is, is open up a series of questions and have some discussions about all the ramifications and fortunately a lot of uncertainties about where we're headed, but I want to echo some of the sentiments, particularly underlined by Susan, that you know, we have had a successful relationship, the transatlantic community that is, for, I, you know, I argue going back to 1916 when we were able to effectively finance Britain and France's victory eventually in the First World War. We had to send troops at one point, but it started out with that. And what, what has led to the 